Hello. How are you guys? I'm doing good. Um, well, as you can see, tonight we're starting a new series that we're calling Goals. Do you guys say the hashtag? Okay, so we just call it Goals? Or do we call it hashtag Goals? No, just Goals. Got it, got it. Okay. So, Goals. Um, in this series, we're going to be talking about a lot of different relationships that we have. So we'll talk about friendships, we'll talk about relationships that we have in our, with our families, and then we're going to talk about dating relationships. And so this week, <laughs> this week and the following week, we're going to be talking about dating relationships. Tonight, I'm speaking specifically to the ladies in the room, so I'm sorry, guys. But if you're smart, you'll actually listen more closely because now you're going to know more about girls, maybe understand them better, see what they're looking for, see what they're going to be doing differently now, maybe. So, But next week, we'll be talking to the boys. So you'll get your turn. <laughs> um, I personally stand up here as an example of someone who has not gotten it all right. As you guys asked earlier, I'm not married. Um, I'm single. Um, and so I am not a picture of somebody who has it all figured out or has it all together, but I'm hoping that I can impart some of what I've learned onto you all, and maybe you won't make the same mistakes that I've made. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm someone who's done things pretty wrong most of the time. And I want to say, too, that one of the, the most painful parts of my time serving and working in ministry has been hearing some of the stories of heartbreak from people your age, people maybe a little bit older than you, even adults. Um, some of the heartbreak that comes out of different relationships in their lives. I've sat and cried with people as they've told me some of these stories. And it seems that <laughs> you just can't escape it, you know? And it's a question that culture almost sets up for us of how do we get this happily ever after, this perfect ending? How do we achieve that? And there's this question almost of how do we avoid this heartbreak. And I think that there's a lot of different factors that play into us getting ourselves into these heartbreaks. Um, for starters, we look at our worth and our value and our identity and who we are. We look for them in all the wrong places. Um, so our first goal tonight, if that's what you want to call it, is going to be to find your identity and your worth and who you are in Christ. And so you know how when you're in grade school, how they have those different journals that you fill out about yourself, where they ask you those different questions? I heard no, that's disappointing because that's the story I'm about to tell. You see them like a lot at this time of year. People are like moms are posting them on social media, pictures of their kids where it's like, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor and my favorite food is spaghetti and I love pink. No? Okay. <laughs> well, when I was younger, we had to do that, and in a minute, not yet, but in a minute, they're going to post a picture of a journal that I had in first grade where, why are you guys laughing? <laughs> oh, did they already put it up? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, they ask you these different questions like, what's your favorite thing about school, and what's your least favorite thing about school, and you're expected to say things like, I love recess, and I hate math class, or those types of things. Well, as you may have seen, I apparently did not get that memo. Um, so here's what I put, if we could put it up now. So, what's funny already? <laughs> so I said, my they asked, my favorite thing about school is what, shh, hold on guys, listen, listen. I said, the tables and Zach and my friends, P.S., Zach is my boyfriend. They said, what's your least favorite thing about school? And I said, I don't think Zach likes me. And then they said, I sit next to you. And I said, anyone in the classroom, mostly my friends are Zach. And I guess on the other page, I must have had some sort of like smiley face or something that bled over. Cause, um, but yeah, we can look at that and think it's funny, right? But I also look at it and there's a part of me that thinks it's really sad. <laughs> like that as a first grader, I'm worried about what this boy thinks of me. And now, as an adult, I couldn't even tell you who that Zach kid is. Um, but clearly, 
He sure meant a lot to me at the time because he was clearly all I thought about. <laughs> um, and I think it's sad that even as children, as young kids, we're so inundated with these messages about relationships um, that even as a first grader, I was already feeling insecure because of what a boy thought of me. Um, and I love kids. I love spending time with them. I love learning from them. And I found that there's this really sweet age for me when they're about like three years old, that they're just like extra special. Um, they're like just learning to speak in full sentences. They're kind of figuring out their surroundings a little bit more. Um, and they're just like the most confident human beings in the entire world. Like there is not a single insecure bone in their body. I mean, at this age, they don't wear pants half the time and they just don't care. Um, they could go out in public with food all over their face and not even know um, where we go out a lot of times, right, girls? And we like can't leave the house without makeup. Um, they think that they're the smartest, most impressive human beings in the entire world. They could go up to a complete stranger. In fact, I've had moments where I've like smiled at a kid in a restaurant and they come up to you and want to talk to you and they're like, hey, guess what? I know the ABCs, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and they just think they're the, like the coolest thing on the planet. They're just so confident. <laughs> but as an adult, it makes me sad because I know that the reality is going to hit where there's going to be a day that they start to experience insecurity. They won't have that confidence where I can go out and I don't care what anyone thinks of me. I don't care who's looking at me. In fact, I want people to look at me and look how great this is and look how cool I am. And insecurity is coming for them someday. And I know that because it came for me and it's come for everybody else I've ever met. <laughs> um, there's some point in our lives where it's like we just awaken to insecurity. We become very self-conscious, very concerned about what everybody else is thinking of us very insecure about different parts of our lives and maybe things that we've experienced. And think about the fact that every person in this room, and I include guys in this when I say this, I think that every person in this room, if I right now said, if you could change one thing about your external experience, uh, appearance, not experience, <laughs> what would it be? I think that everyone, including guys, even as shallow as that, we're not even talking about personality or life experiences, but even as shallow as that, if you can change one thing about your external appearance, what would it be? I think we could all pick something off the top of our heads. <laughs> you don't have to say it, but <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, and insecurity is something that we could unpack completely on its own. But I also think it's interesting that insecurity always seems to come from this mark in our life of embarrassment. Like we had some sort of experience where we were in a situation that we thought was normal, but then maybe we were embarrassed because somebody said something or we realized that maybe what we were doing wasn't the most normal or the most cool. And it's marked by this moment of embarrassment. And the hard thing about relationships at your guys' age is that usually, you hear the rare story of a high school sweetheart, but usually they're probably going to end. And ending things usually comes with some amount of that embarrassment or that hurt or pain or drama. And that can often bring about insecurity. So for example, I dated a guy long distance once. Um, we had been friends for years and years and years, and he was actually a year older than me. And so it was his first semester of college. He was about to move away, and we finally decided to start dating. And um, when we did that, we dated for probably about 10 months. And we ended things because he started seeing somebody else. And, <laughs> and I can't even tell you how many insecurities that brought about in my life. Thoughts like, I'm not good enough. I clearly wasn't good enough for him. Thoughts like, I'm not worth waiting for locationally. Like, thoughts that I can't trust anybody. It's made me, even now, never, ever want to even consider pursuing a long-distance relationship again. It could be the get best guy in the world. I thought that he was, but I never even want to think about ever going there again because I'm afraid of the pain it'll cause me. It scares the life out of me. I also dated a guy in high school who made me feel pressured to get a lot more physical with him a lot more quickly than I was comfortable with. And that also gave me more of those thoughts of I'm not worth waiting for, not just locationally, but physically, that who I am as a person, my character wasn't worth waiting to give him what he wanted. 
It made me feel in future relationships like I'm just damaged goods. For the good, the good godly guys that came after him, that I, had, that I felt like I had already messed myself up too much and I was too far gone. I would think that they're too good for me. I've actually broken up with a guy before because he was too nice, which what does that even mean? <laughs> because I didn't feel like I was good enough for him because how could he like someone like me? Because if he really knew me and my story and where I've been and the things that I've done and the things that have been done to me, how could someone like him possibly like me? And it almost causes you to settle for less than you deserve. You go after these guys who, oh, he won't care about my past or about this thing that I did or this thing that happened to me. And I think that's it for a lot of us girls, right? We begin to think that a good godly guy, a good godly guy could never like me. I'm just damaged goods. And I so desperately wish that I could have a conversation with each of you individually where I could tell you that you are not damaged goods. You're not. You are so much more. And I wish that somebody had told me that when I was your age. Because I think that we bought this lie, but the truth is that we just need to take time to heal. And that's okay. God's not done with you. You're not too far gone. And I don't know what insecurity looks like for you. Maybe it looks a lot similarly to the stories that I've shared, or maybe it looks completely different. But I do know that insecurity is something that will rob us, if you and I allow it, it will rob us from experiencing and really becoming everything that God wants us to become. It may even rob you from your future spouse because you're thinking a good godly guy could never like me. I'm just damaged goods. And so you don't even give him the chance to make that decision because you've already decided for him. You cut the legs right out from under the relationship. But we can fight insecurity with our God-given identity. Our goal is finding our worth, our, our identity in Christ. And do you know what the most true thing about each and every one of you is? Whatever God says about you. The things that God says, this is who you are, are the most true labels you will ever wear in your life. The labels you wear of I'm too fat, I'm too small, I'm too ugly, I'm not good enough, I don't play the right sport, I don't do the right things, I'm not lovable, I'm dysfunctional in relationships. Whatever the labels you have worn in the past or wear to this day, they're lies when you compare them to what God says about you. So what are some of the things that God says about you? Some labels that aren't lies. God says that you're loved, that you were created on purpose. He made you on purpose. You're pure and righteous and holy. He says that everything in your past, everything in your present, it does not define you the way that Christ does. You've been forgiven. You've been redeemed. You're a child of God. Those are the labels that are the things that are the most true about you. And ultimately, ladies, it's not even about how much confidence you have. It's about what has you confident. Are you finding your confidence in yourself? Are you finding your confidence in guys? Are you finding your confidence in the things you do on the weekends? Are you finding your confidence in, other, in school and other things of this world? Or are you finding your confidence in the God who made you, the God who loves you, the God who saves you, and the God who calls you holy and righteous and redeemed. And some of us need to take some time away from relationships so we can focus on that, on what God says about us, about who we are so we can become okay. And that's okay to take that time, to take some time to heal. While you're single, make the most of being single. Being single is not a curse. It's not a disease to be cured. You're not stuck in some holding pattern where you can't do anything worthwhile until you're in a relationship. The time you spend single, which may be a temporary life stage or it could be your whole life, is actually a gift if you'll treat it as that. Being single gives you more free time, regardless of how busy you think you may be with school or with sports or with other things you have going on, you're still less busy than you would be if you were in a relationship. And so use your free time as a single person to prepare yourself for what's next for you. The most I heard once that the most loving thing that you can do for your future spouse is to work on yourself right now before you even start dating them. 
to work on yourself. Break those bad habits that would cause problems in a relationship. Recover from past hurts or from mistakes that you've made. Start doing the things now that will make you a better partner in the future. You won't become perfect, so I'm not saying that you should just wait until you're perfect to pursue a relationship. That's not what I'm saying. But get yourself in a good place where you're not carrying major baggage with you into a relationship. God has given you this season. He's given you this hour. He's given you this moment. And you can use it to sit around and wallow, to feel sorry for yourself, to wish that you had more than you do, or you can use it to get healthy. And for many of us, this means getting into good community and walking authentically in relationship with other believers who you can confide in and who can really help guide you. Peers and mentors, seeking those out. Seeking out people you can be honest and real with. And if you don't tell people about a relationship you're in. That's something that I did a lot when I was in high school and even in college, where I wouldn't tell my family about this guy that I was dating at school, or I wouldn't tell my school friends about this guy I was dating at camp. I like to keep things really separate. If you're hiding things, that's a red flag. Really anything, not just for relationships, but when you begin hiding things, you should be concerned. (laughs) When we invite others in and we give them permission to speak into our lives, They can hold us accountable to these things that we say we want to be. They can protect us from future hurts. There are benefits to being single, and there are benefits to being in a relationship. And there's also downsides to both of those things. So wherever you find yourself, whether you're single or if you're in a relationship, make the most of what you have right now and strive to be content with it. The truth is that dysfunctional people date dysfunctional people, and they do so in a dysfunctional way. A relationship can only be as healthy as the least healthy person. So it's not just about making sure you're in a good place, but also about finding someone else who is. And I want to pause really quick here just to say that if you're already in a relationship, I'm not saying that you need to break up with that person. But I'm also not saying that just because you're already in a relationship that you should stay together. I think that over these next few weeks, as we're in this series, goals, not hashtag goals, that you have an opportunity to evaluate the different relationships in your life, whether they are dating relationships or if they're friendships or relationships in your family, and see the things that you can be doing differently. And maybe there are relationships that you need to cut out. But I'm not saying that's what you need to do. I just think this is a good opportunity to evaluate those different relationships. And so the first goal was for you to find your worth, know your worth and identity in Christ to work through that. But our second goal is to find someone else whose identity and worth are in Christ. So what should we be looking for in a boyfriend? First, you should find someone who's also Christian. And maybe this is the most obvious one, but I still think it's necessary to talk about. You are headed towards dangerous territory if the trajectory of his life is not moving towards Jesus. And we like to think, I think that this is an important that they could become a Christian eventually. I've heard people say, like, well, it's easy to become a Christian. It's really hard to become good-looking. Like, we just don't think that it's that big of a deal. But if the most central part of your life isn't something that they even kind of care about, then you're setting yourself up for failure because you're either going to cap your intimacy with Christ or you're going to cap your intimacy with this person because your values aren't aligned. And so do I think it's a bad idea to just date? I used to would have probably said, used to would have probably, (laughs) I might have said before, no, I don't think it's a bad idea to date. I think I have good memories from dating. I think it's fun that you can figure out what you like. But now as I began to write this, I think, yeah, it's a bad idea to just date. And here's why. Is it possible for you to fall in love with someone who doesn't love God? If you're a Christian, if you love God, Is it possible for you to fall in love with someone who doesn't? Yes, absolutely. Of course you can. And you're setting yourself up for heartbreak. And if this isn't someone that you really see a future or even possibly a marriage with, you're at the very most setting yourself up for heartbreak. Because the longer you spend with them, the more attached you're going to become to them, and the more hurtful the ending will be. And I want to be really clear here. 
When I say you should find someone that you can see a future with or that's marriage material, I'm not saying that you need to be talking about or planning your wedding together, um, especially on a first or second date. Um, that's really a little bit weird and kind of inappropriate. Um, but it's about guarding your heart. It's about being intentional, not about being intense. That Talking about that so early or sometimes even like at this age in general could either set up false expectations or rightfully scare that person away. The goal of a first date is to get to know each other and to see if you want to pursue the relationship further. And actually, that's not just the goal of the first date. That's the goal of every date that you go on until you get married. If you decide at any point that you don't want to pursue the relationship any further, you need to tell them. You need to end it, which I think is something that we as ladies sometimes avoid. Like when we think, I'm not really into it anymore. I'm not really feeling it. We get worried about hurting their feelings or making all this drama in their life or our own. And so we just kind of avoid it and hope that things will begin to change or kind of try to like fade out of the relationship without really saying anything. But if you decide that it's not going to work out, you're going to need to let him know. Like eventually, right? Or just marry him and be miserable. I don't know. So don't just be short in text and stop answering calls and not hang out anymore and hope that he figures it, figures it out. That's so much worse. That's so much more mean. If we're trying not to be mean, that's so much more mean. Be gentle, but be clear. And another thing we want to avoid is attracting guys for all the wrong reasons. There's a saying that says how you win them is, is how you keep them, and I would add that it's also how you lose them. So if you catch a guy by playing games like keeping the upper hand or trying to make him jealous with other guys, you're dooming your entire relationship to be filled either with playing games or to end because you were playing games. If you catch a guy for your body, you're either going to have to maintain him for your body, which I promise you only continues to get more and more intense as time goes on, or you're going to lose him for your body. And really the type of guy that's attracted to you because of those things is not someone that you want to be in a relationship with. And I want, if you're in this room and you are in a relationship, if you're dating someone, if you're talking to someone, whatever lingo that you guys use with that stuff now, um, if you're in that season of life, I want you to uh, truly evaluate, like, what am I attracted to in this person? Because I think when I was in junior high or high school, I don't think I could have told you. Like, maybe I would have said, well, he looks really good, or he drives a nice car, and sometimes he lets me drive it, or, like, I don't know. Like, all of my reasons were so shallow, I don't think I could have told you that. So if your list is, I like the way he looks, or I like how tall he is, or he has a nice car, and he always picks me up on time, and he comes from a wealthy family, if those are the criteria that you have, if you can't come up with anything that's not superficial or shallow or fleeting, if the things inside of you are not like, I like the way that he treats others. I like his character. I see the way that he cares for people when no one else is watching. I like the way he treats my friends and my family. There's something about him, and clearly the Spirit of God is working in his life because he's not focused on himself or making much of himself. He's making much of God, and he's always worried about everybody else. And we have really great conversation, and I've just never met anybody like him. If you can't think of anything that's not superficial about the person that you're dating, you should probably be concerned. Because those things won't last. What's going to last is character and integrity and the spirit that he has. And God's word talks a lot more about love as an action than it does about love as a feeling. And so, for example, we're given commands to love others. Mark 12, 30 through 31 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. John 13, 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then I'm sure you've heard this one before. Love is also described in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. It says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And all of those are things that you do, not things that you feel. Because sometimes feelings will fail. The eighth verse there is love never fails, and feelings sometimes will fail you. But love, since it's an action, will never fail. You can always love someone regardless of how you feel in a moment. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have strong feelings of love for the person that you're dating, but I am saying that you need to base your decision on far more than just your feelings. Is he a person of integrity? That's something I've said a few times tonight, so you might be thinking, what's a person of integrity? Well, let's talk about a few traits that somebody of integrity would exhibit. Honesty. Is he honest? Does he say what he means and do what he says? Does he go out of his way to speak in whole and complete truth? Verse 6 of that 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Does he rejoice with truth? Is he kind? Is he nice to those around him? Colossians 3.12 says, Clothe yourselves with kindness. And I've always loved that wording there because it's like a total embodiment. You're wearing it. You're putting it on yourself. Clothe yourself with kindness. Is he selfless? Does he think of your needs and the needs of others ahead of his own? Is he generous and willing to share his possessions and his time with others? Ephesians 5.25 tells husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, and he did that selflessly and sacrificially. Is he patient? That's the first word used to describe love in those verses in 1 Corinthians. Is he patient? Is he willing to wait for good things? Does he value you enough to wait for you? Is he gentle? Philippians 4 or 5 says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit too, which really anything in the list of fruit of the Spirit is stuff you should be looking for in a guy. And besides showing you what you should look for in a guy, this list also kind of doubles to serve to show you what you should strive to be. And if you're in that season where you're trying to get into that healthy place, start here. Start with this list. Work on being honest and kind and selfless patient and gentle. Statistically, most people in this room will get married. However, that doesn't mean that everyone will. Some people will choose not to get married just because they have no desire to, and others, honestly, won't get married even though they want to. And to those people, I want to say that's okay. You are okay. It may not seem like it's okay. It may seem like you're missing out and like your life won't be complete, but relationships or marriage are not the end goal of life. Marriage doesn't make you complete. You're already complete. Being single does not mean that you're somehow broken or flawed. For every single single person, there's someone who wishes, who's married and wishes they were single. When I talked through some of this with Barbie, she said that her mom used to tell her, better to be alone than to wish you were. You do not need to find anyone else to be, okay, to be okay, to be whole, to be complete. Jesus already did that for you. Colossians 2.10 says, you are complete in him. And if there's one thing that I want you to leave thinking about tonight, it would be where do you find your worth? And my prayer is that each and every single one of you would find your worth in Christ And that the people you pursue in a relationship would be people who have found their worth in Christ. So let's pray. God, thank you for um, bringing us here tonight for this opportunity to spend time with one another, to laugh with one another, to hopefully learn more about you and um, what you want for us, God. Um, I pray that as a result of a line that was sung or something that they heard tonight or a conversation that was had that the students here would um, learn more about what it means to be your child, would grow to love you more. I pray that we would walk through this um, messy season of figuring out relationships and their lives with them, that um, you would draw close to them and show them that they're loved and cared for and valued and that they're already complete and show them what they should be looking for in relationships and protect them from relationships that are going to be harmful to them, God. We love you, and we're so thankful for the way that you love us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.